Well, if we have never met before, this is your first time here. My name's Chris. I'm the associate pastor, and I'm glad to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, I have a quick confession time for you guys. I need to get something off my chest. I love to talk. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me based on my quiet and reserved nature, but talking is something that comes very natural to me. I've never really had a problem expressing myself and using my words. Uh, in fact, when I was a toddler, my mother told me that I didn't even like have to work my way into talking. I just kind of mumbled my way through life until I started speaking full sentences. Now, her mistake in this is that when I started talking, she didn't stop me. And so I just never stopped. Here's what I love about words, though. Words have power. Throughout my very extensive 27 years of life, I have gotten to watch as my words have had some very incredible and awesome effects on people, but I've also gotten to watch them have some very disastrous outcomes. Now, there's this old, ancient proverb. It's been quoted by many distinct philosophers over the years. It's very poetic, very true. It goes something like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Now, that phrase sounds really good in theory. The problem with that is, is that words can absolutely hurt you because our words, whether we realize it or not, have a powerful effect on others. Proverbs 18, 21 says it this way, that the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, these are pretty extreme words to describe this from Solomon. But if the wisest man who ever lived knew that the tongue was so dangerous, we should probably heed his warning. In fact, the Bible mentions the tongue over 120 different times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the vast majority of these times are warnings to speak wisely and with caution. So here's what this tells us, is that God cares about and is concerned about how we control our speech, and we should be too. But the question to ask and answer this morning is, what do we say and what do we avoid? Well, we're finishing up our series, Games We Play, this morning, and we're taking a look at the game Taboo. Now, if you have never played Taboo before, let me go ahead and tell you, it is a game that is made for people who are really good with words. The whole goal of the game is to collect as many cards as you can in a time limit, and the way it works is these cards have a word on it, and your partner tries to guess this word. However, there are words listed out on this card that you cannot use to describe this, this word. And so you're trying to get as many of these as you can, but if at any point you say the word on the card or any of these taboo words, you get buzzed, or in recent years, you get a squeaker, and you have to throw that card away and keep going. So the whole goal of this game is to help someone understand a concept or a word without ever using the word or any words that would describe it. So I actually want to play this game with you very quickly this morning. I want you to describe yourself as a Christian without using any of these words. Jesus, faith, God, Bible, or church. Now, you don't have to shout your answers out at me because if you all speak, I'm not gonna understand you anyway. But I want you to sit and think about this for a second. It's difficult, right? If you couldn't call yourself a Christian, if your faith wasn't a name tag that you got to wear around, if your attendance on Sunday mornings was not an argument you got to make towards being a follower of Christ, how would people know? Well, Jesus talked about this with the disciples in Matthew 7, 18 through 20. He said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, when Jesus said this, he's talking specifically about false prophets with his disciples. But the same rule applies to understanding people's faith. Jesus says that you can tell whether people are the real deal or not by their fruit. And what he means by this is that even if somebody never told you they were a Christian, it should be evident in everything about them, from their actions to even their speech. So, let me ask you a question as we get started this morning. Does your speech speak to your faith? If you could not tell people you were a Christian, would the way you talk point people to Jesus? Would they see your faith in everything you do, 
Or would the only proof you have towards your faith be when you spoke directly about it? Now, here's why this is important. When we started this series, Nathan and I kicked off the year with the challenge to live out the mission of showing intentional grace to others one person at a time. That's the mission of Karis City. Because we believe that grace changes everything. That if we can show the grace of Jesus to others, then we will get the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with them. And that will change our church, it will change our city, and it will change our world. But here's the deal. If you wanna have the kind of impact that changes people's eternities, you can't accomplish this mission without controlling your speech. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, we're gonna be in James 3 this morning, and we're gonna work kind of backwards through it, and we're gonna start by looking at verses nine through 12. James writes, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. That out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. If you want to have the kind of impact that changes people's eternities, you have to control your speech because your speech testifies to your faith. And here's why this is important. Because you cannot show the grace of Jesus to others without speaking with the same truth and grace that you're trying to show people. James says that this is like going to a freshwater spring, drinking from it, expecting fresh water, and getting salt water. Now, I don't know about you, but salt water is not my favorite drink. And I didn't have to spend my entire life comparing fresh water and salt water to come to that decision. I figured it out pretty quickly. You know, when I was younger, my family would go on vacations to the beach every year, and my brother and I, we loved to ride the waves on boogie boards. And so what we would do was very smart. We'd wait until the flags were red when you're not supposed to be in the water, because that's when the waves were big, and we would swim out with these boogie boards, and we would ride the waves back and forth to the shore and back over and over and over again. And it's so much fun. But riding these waves often came at a cost, because as you would expect, every once in a while, One of those waves is a little too much to handle, and it would throw you over. Now, that in and of itself was not the big deal, right? Because you can get back up, you're fine, you're in water. But if you timed it just right, and I mean just right, as you were coming up out of that water, gasping for breath, you'd get smacked in the face with a second wave, and you would take in a nice big gulp of salt water to wash down your defeat. Now, if you've never unexpectedly drank salt water, I will have you know It's not a pleasant experience. It's quite shocking, in fact, because your body feels water, but it doesn't taste like water. And so as your body expects this refreshment, instead you're left with a sour taste in your mouth. And James says this is what it's like to encounter a Christian who speaks with ungodly language. And so what he means by this is that if people come to you and they're expecting this freshness of life, this living water that Jesus brings, but you spew salt water back at them, it leaves a sour taste in their mouth. And so when people come to church and they're expecting to hear Jesus, they're expecting to feel this refreshment, but in his followers, what they hear is coarse language and harshness and bitterness and lies and gossip and slander. Who would want to be a part of that? Because I'll promise you, if your speech is not godly, it will never drive people to Jesus. It will drive them away from him. But there's this very false belief that's been spread around the church lately that there's this idea that if we would just look like the world and talk like the world and act like the world, that maybe that would draw the world to us. Because if they saw that we were just like them, then maybe they would follow what we believe. But here's the issue with this. We're not like them. In fact, Jesus talked about it this way with his disciples in John 15, 19. He said, if you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And that is why the world hates you. The goal of the church is not to look like the world. It's to change the world. And so you don't have the ability to live out grace and not speak with grace. Because if the only proof that you have that you're a Christian to others is the cross on around your neck or the one printed on your t-shirt, 
something's wrong. See, your speech, it testifies to who you are. Does your speech speak to your faith? When people listen to you talk, do they see Jesus or do they see the world? Do they experience fresh water or do they experience salt water? If you want to have the kind of impact that changes lives, you have to control your speech just as much as you do your actions. So, learn to speak with the fresh living water, not the shocking taste of salt water. Now, controlling your speech is important to having this kind of impact. But there's a challenge with this. James tells us that the tongue is not so easily tamed. Look with me at our next verses. We're going to kind of jump back to the beginning to verses 3 through 8. James writes, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, that it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, there is some good news in what James writes here, right? Because James tells us that if you can learn to control the tongue, then you can control the body. And what he means by this is if you ever learn to control your speech, man, living out the mission of intentional grace, that's child's play because controlling your tongue, this is the highest level of self-control you can have. But that's about the only good news James gives you, if I'm being honest. Because right after James tells us that the tongue can control the body, he drops a sobering truth on us, that the tongue is untamable by you. Now, the issue with this is, is that we have a tendency to think that we can contain the tongue, right? We think that we can control it, that we can learn to use it, but I want to tell you very clearly, it doesn't work. But there is a very dangerous lie that is believed by the church so often that controlling your tongue is simply a matter of choosing your words. But I want you to look back at verses, uh, Proverbs 18.21 with me. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So this verse is very often misquoted and misinterpreted by other pastors and other Christians over time. Because it's a verse that if you read it at first, you would think that you would have the ability to choose whether your words bring life or death. And that outcome is ultimately up to you. But the issue with this is that if you look at the literal Hebrew translation, the original wording here, it is very clear. The power of the tongue is not life or death. It's life and death. And so... No matter how hard you try, if you try to control the tongue in your own power, it's not going to work out because you can put forth all the effort in the world that you want to, and for a little while, you probably will produce life. But in your own power, it will eventually give way to death. That choosing your words is not how you control the tongue because you, in your own power, cannot tame the tongue. Now, is that an excuse for you to let your tongue just go wild and have whatever effect it wants? No, because the reality is that you can't control your tongue, but God can. And so where your lack of control brings death, God's control brings life. Now, my wife and I have two dogs. They're sheep dogs, Anatolian Shepherd and Great Pyrenees. They're incredible. They're very strong animals. And collectively, they weigh about 180 pounds, which is the size of a full-grown man. Now, my wife, thank God, is not a full-grown man, nor is she as strong as one. And so she really does not like to take both of these dogs out at the same time. And there's a reason for that, because she'll take them out together, and most of the time, it's not that big of a deal. 
But every once in a while, someone lets their dog outside, thinking it's going to be a nice, easy time. And it's game over at that point. As soon as my dog see that dog, they're off to the races. And they will, this is not a can, they will drag Hannah to the ground through our apartment complex. It's happened multiple times. The reality is, is that Hannah cannot control those dogs by herself. Now, does she just open our door and let them off their leash to, fr- to freely roam and run and play and tackle other animals? No. If the dogs need to go outside at the same time, Hannah comes and gets me because I can control the dogs. Luckily for me, I'm the size of two grown men. So controlling the dogs, very easy. In the same way, that just because we cannot control our tongue does not mean that we let it wreak havoc in our lives and in the world around us. And so instead of trying to wrestle with your words, submit them to God because he holds all power and authority and he can control the tongue. And so this is how you control the tongue. It is submission to God. Look at what Solomon says about this in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, learning to control your tongue, it's not about choosing what words you say. It's about choosing who you submit to. So you can make the choice to submit to your tongue and let its power continue to wreak havoc in the world around you. Or... You can choose to submit to God and let his power of life transform everything about you, including your speech. And here's why this is so important. See, the way that we grow, the way that we change is through a relationship with God. And the way you grow in this relationship with God is through submission. Paul talks about it this way in Galatians 5, that he details what's called the fruit of the Spirit. That as we submit to God, we grow in the areas of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I know that's a lot if you're a note taker, Galatians 5. But this is how we grow in relationship with God, and this is how we find life change, including with our speech. It is submission to God. But here's the deal. This submission is not merely saying that we trust in God. It's not that we give God a piece of our life or a part of who we are. True submission requires full surrender. The problem with this is, is we don't really like that all the time. We like to give God pieces of our life and want him to change all of it. And so we expect this radical change in every part of our life without giving God every part of our life. But it doesn't work this way. If you want to experience this kind of change, true submission means full surrender of everything about you, everything you are, everything you do, everything you say, fully submitted to God. So let me ask you, are you submitting fully to God? Does he have authority and dominion over every part of your life? Or are there things that you're holding back from him? And look, I don't know what that could be for you. For some of you, maybe it's simply unrepentant sin. There are things in your life that you were struggling with or holding on to, and you need to give that up to God and follow him in obedience. Maybe that's not your problem. Maybe it's priorities for you. Maybe your job or your bank account matters way more to you than your relationship with God. Maybe it's your image or your success. Maybe it's friendships or relationships that have priority for you. Maybe it's something as simple as you don't want to change the way you talk, but you want God to change everything else about you. But here's the brutal truth. If you want this kind of life change, this real change that transforms everything about you. If you want to control your speech, it comes through full submission to God. So controlling your speech, it's not about choosing what words you say. It's about choosing who you submit to. Now, as you grow in your relationship with God through submission and as you learn what this looks like, you will learn over time to avoid the things of death that are caused by an untamed tongue. That's good. But if you want your speech to speak to your faith, it's also important for you to learn what it looks like to speak life into other people's lives. So look with me at our last verses in James. This is verses 17 and 18. James writes, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving and considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, James finishes up James 3, this chapter, with the section where he kind of details what it looks like to live within the wisdom of God through conduct and speech. And so he goes on to list different qualities that we are both to avoid, but qualities that we are to grow in. And I want to focus on the qualities that he talks about us learning and growing in, because I believe these qualities will help your speech speak to your faith. Now, the first quality that he mentions is that our speech has to be pure. And what he's talking about here is not specifically just that you don't cuss or that you don't use coarse language, but it's really more broad and somehow still deep than that. What he means by a pure speech is that it, does your speech have any sinfulness to it? Is there any sinful attitude? Is there any sinful motive? Is there any sin present in it at all? Now, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because I have a little bit of homework for you, and I know you guys hate to hear that. But I want to challenge you with this to take some time this week and think through the question, is my speech pure? If you were to look at your speech, are there areas of your life that would keep it from being pure? Are there areas that you need to grow in so that your speech can be pure and blameless? And is the way you talk held to the perfect standards of God? Now, I will promise you the answer to that is no. But this is not a moment for you to go, eh, my speech is pretty good and I'm okay with it. Take an opportunity this week to really think on and reflect what would it look like for your speech to be free from sin. And I want to challenge you to find those areas that you need to submit in to grow in obedience and grow in purity through your speech. Now, the next two qualities that James talks about are peacefulness and submissive. And that word for submissive is actually the Greek word epiakes, and that word actually means gentleness. And I love that James talks about these ideas of peacefulness and gentleness because, I'm going to be honest with you, I think these are qualities that are so often lacking in the way Christians speak. And so the reality for us as Christians is that we are called to share the truth of Jesus. Absolutely true. We are called to stand against sin and to stand for God's word as we share his message and make disciples. Now, the problem with this is that we have a really, really bad habit of sharing the truth of Jesus in really wrong ways. There was a study done in 2023 by the Barner Research Group, and they asked people the question, why do you doubt your faith or why do you doubt the legitimacy of the church? And two out of the top three answers in this entire pool of people were that people had very bad experiences in church or they viewed the church because of its negative reputation. See, the church today is known more for what we stand against than what we stand for. The church is known today more for how we've hurt people in the past than how we've helped them. And that's so backwards from what we're supposed to be known for. But if I'm being honest with you, it is a direct result of a lack of gentleness and peacefulness from Christians. And see, I think a lot of this stems from the issue that we feel a conflict within us, that we feel the need to choose between grace and truth, that somehow we have to pick one or the other. And the problem with this is, is if we're not careful, this false belief leads to an extreme view that sharing the grace of Jesus would mean that you are too soft and you are accepting of sin. And that extreme view will lead to an extreme solution of sharing only truth and removing grace from the equation. But showing the true love of Jesus means that you walk in the tension of grace and truth. And so, yes, we absolutely have to share the truth of Jesus. But if you want to share the truth of Jesus, you must first share grace. I love how Randy Acorn talks about this in one of his books. He says, truth without grace breeds a self-righteous legalism that poisons the church and pushes the world from Christ. That grace without truth breeds moral indifference and keeps people from seeing their need for Christ. And attempts to soften the gospel by minimizing truth keeps people from Jesus. But attempts to toughen the gospel by minimizing grace also keeps people from Jesus. That it's not enough for us to offer grace or truth. We must offer grace. If you want to change people's lives, it's not about sharing grace or truth. 
We have to share both. And see, these qualities of gentleness and peacefulness are so important for us to live this out. Because I can't tell you the amount of times that I see Christians, whether it's in person or on Facebook and all these other things, where they're arguing with unbelievers or I hear about Christians who have found, you know, the next company that this is the one we got to boycott and here's why we boycott it. Because we feel like that's how we stand for Jesus. But living out the peacefulness of God means that you lead with love. Rather than picking arguments or trying to demonstrate moral or religious superiority. Now, I understand there are some of you, I can see the tension in your face, and you're like, but we got to share truth. Yes. But here's what I'll promise you. If you will make the decision to lead with grace, to show love to others and welcome them as they are, you will get the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with them and help them see how they're wrong. Now, that truth must be shared in gentleness. And so this idea of gentleness, if you'll remember, is this idea of sharp edges being removed. And so here's the truth about the truth of Jesus. It will always convict. There is a piercing of the heart and of the soul that comes from us speaking the word of God. But just because what you say is true does not give you free reign to say it however you please. The way that you choose to share the truth of Jesus can be the difference between conviction and wounding. And so I would challenge you to caution yourself to think wisely about how you deal with others and to share the truth of Jesus with gentleness. And look, this is kind of what this looks like. We'll explain it in a second. But sharing truth with gentleness is going to look a lot like being as harsh as you need to be to get someone's attention, but going no further than that. And here's what that means in practicality. You will have to deal with different people in different ways. There are some people that you can get down on one knee and very gently explain to them truth. And they'll be like, I get it. And then there's people like me. I have to have a very stern, direct approach because you're not getting through this thick head otherwise. And it's the same thing with other people. There are differences in how you have to interact with others in order to get their attention and show them the truth of Jesus. But I would challenge you and caution you that as you do this, to not let your words become reactive, but instead let them be responsive. Don't react to different conversations or even arguments with anger and bitterness and harshness, but respond in all ways with the grace of God and let that truth lead to life change. Now, the next qualities that James talks about are being considerate and full of mercy. And that word for considerate is a Greek word that lends to this idea of being pliable but not bending. And here's how this applies to your speech. You need to be able to admit when you were wrong and other people are right. Now, confession time number two for you. I am speaking to myself just as much as I'm speaking to you because I'm going to let you know a little secret about me. I am stubborn. I am very stubborn. And I like to think that I'm right all the time. And if I have convinced myself that I'm right and you're wrong, I will fight you tooth and nail over what I believe. Now, the problem with this in my life, I have found that I am often wrong. And one of the ways that I've had to grow is to learn to be able to admit that, hey, I'm wrong, you're right, let's do it that way. And that's an area that every single one of us need to grow in. But now, the flip side of this is that there are going to be moments in your life where the people around you are wrong, whether that's in opinion or in actions. And you have an opportunity and an obligation to share the mercy and the grace of God through forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says that we are to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So when someone's wrong, what do we do? We forgive them because God forgave us first. And we move forward together in reconciliation. 
Now, the next quality that James talks about is being impartial. And there's a real danger if we're not careful in the church for the church to go from this place full of different people of races and backgrounds and cultures to kind of this like Sunday morning country club where it's just full of the same people over and over again. But the reality is this isn't what church is supposed to look like. It's not what the kingdom of God looks like. Look at how the kingdom of God is described in Philippians 2, 10 through 11. It says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue, that means language, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So heaven is this beautiful picture of different races, different backgrounds, different cultures, different ethnicities, all these different things together, beautifully unified in the name of Christ. And here's the deal. The church should be a reflection of heaven. So how can we accomplish that here at Karis City, and how does your speech play a part in that? Well, if you want to play a part in helping the diversity of the church grow, the biggest way that you can do that is inviting people to church. Now, shameless plug for you, I have an easy way you can do that. As you leave today, there's a sign that says, you can change a life this week. On that sign are invite cards. Grab a couple of those and take them because those invite cards are the easiest way you can start a conversation with someone about church. And I have a challenge for you with this. It comes in two parts. I want to challenge you this week to invite someone to church in person, not over the phone, not over text, a face-to-face conversation. And here's the second part of this challenge. If we're going to live out this quality of being impartial, I don't want you just to invite your best friend down the road who you've known for 25 years. Invite people who are different from you. Invite people you don't know. Invite the people you don't like. Invite the very people you would least expect to ever come to church. Because here's what I'll promise you. If we will show the love of Jesus and welcome people as they are and bring them here, you will be blown away by how all kinds of different people will respond to the gospel, the truth of God's word, and become a part of God's kingdom in Karis City. Now, I'm gonna close with the last qualities that James talks about, and that is full of good fruit and sincere. Now that word sincere that James uses is the Greek word anapokritos. And what that word means is without hypocrisy. And so what James is saying is that the last qualities he talks about are the most important because they deal directly with whether our speech speaks to faith. So when he writes, is your speech sincere, what he's saying is, is it the real deal? Is it real or is it fake? Is it, is it proved by your actions and does it testify to who you are and what you believe? Now, at the beginning of this message, I asked you a simple question. Does your speech speak to your faith? And I asked you that because it's the same question that James ends up wrapping up with here. Is your speech the real deal? Is it sincere? Is it full of good fruit? Is it producing life as you grow in a relationship with God? Or is it a facade that will eventually lead to destruction. Now the truth of the matter is, you have a decision you'll have to make. You're gonna have to choose whether you submit to your tongue and let its power wreak havoc in your life and in the world around you, or you can let God tame your speech and let him use it for something miraculous. And listen, I get it. Submitting your entire life to God, it's a lot. Controlling your speech sounds nearly impossible. But it's possible with God. And here's what I'll promise you. It's the same thing that James promises at the end of this passage. That if you will learn to control your speech, it will reap a harvest of righteousness. That controlling your speech will not only change you, but it will point people to Jesus. It will change their lives and it may even change their eternities. So let your speech speak to your faith. If we're gonna live out this mission of intentional grace and change the world, then submit to God and let him change you. Let him change your speech and learn to speak life to others. And man, if you will do that, 
you will be blown away by the impact that our church gets to have this year, by all the amazing things that God does. So, what will you do? Will you let your tongue be an uncontrollable fire? Or will you let it be an unstoppable force for the kingdom of God? Let's pray.